Mr. Bailey would like to uh, say something. I, I asked Troy for permission to give my testimony. Mr. Bailey, get over here so the folks on the camera can okay. see. <laughs> Start over. And so I, uh, I stand now in the need of prayer, as among the others in the group. Since I'm the oldest in the crowd, probably a good thing to do. My parents married in 1922. Now, I was born in 1930 at the end of the year, in November. My parents were Methodists, and the church was right across the street. We didn't have to go to a car or anything. We just walk across the street. And then the Methodist church, uh, they're not noted for teaching scripture. At least that's been my experience with them. Now, in a Methodist church, you're not expected to bring a Bible. Lots of times there will be a pew Bible, but in the Baptist church, you have to hold it up, you know, when you're there with, with the Bible. And other churches are different. But I went to the Methodist church even at the time in which I would fall asleep in the bench. You know. <laughs> My parents uh, were very much involved with the church, so I was involved with the church, not necessarily personally, but I mean, there was never any question in my mind but what Jesus Christ existed. There was never any question in my mind but what God created the earth through the agency of Christ. And I went through, uh, we had a Methodist preacher who was the, one of the best preachers we'd ever had. And it was during his time that I became actually involved with joining the church, with making myself part of the church and a, a believer in Jesus Christ and what he had done. I was 13. And of course, I did everything the Bible said do all the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Not exactly. That. I always felt like God had his hand on me. Even though as a teenager, the only girls who were interested in me were members of the Church of Christ. So it was sort of funny with the other, my compatriots in the fact that I could not get a Methodist girl interested in me. <laughs> and it's very interesting because when I got to college and in uh, the, my sophomore year, a young girl came to church, came to the college, and she was a member of the Church of Christ, and we got interested in together and I did not know it at the time it took some time for me to know it but actually her mother had come and come and visited my mother and me when I was newly born and she was pregnant with that girl oh, wow. <laughs> there's more to that story but we'll get to that <laughs> later and after college I went to um, the Army. I was a mil military policeman and she, I asked her to marry me in March of 1952 and she said yes in March of 1953. So we were married. I was in the service. It, I had to go to a school and all so we did not get together as married couple until, well, June, something like that, June, July. And we lived in Jacksonville, Alabama, and I was stationed at Fort McCullough. Then in November, I got orders to go overseas, but in the meantime, I would go to Gordon, Fort Gordon for a month to school, and then I would go overseas. So I left, went overseas and spent the first wedding anniversary 6,000 miles away from my wife. Now, 
I was a Methodist and she was Church of Christ. They're not exactly the same way of believing, you understand. There is a difference. And because there was a difference, I did not accept the tenets of, of the, what the Church of Christ was preaching as to how you might be saved. But she believed in Jesus Christ, and I believed in Jesus Christ, so we were able to make fellowship through our belief in Jesus Christ. She continued all of her life to go to the Church of Christ, and I went to the Methodist Church until, whoa, one day I found a Bible teaching church. Now, <clears throat> I had gotten on to the route that my father had carried for 44, mail, 44 years. I had uh, became a rural mail carrier, and <clears throat> At about that time in, in radio history, a FM stations carried all kinds of preachers. Vernon McGee, uh, uh, John MacArthur, Oliver B. Green, all of them. And I got to listening to them on the radio almost all day long as I was on the route. I was listening to good preachers preaching conservative Christianity. And then I found this church that was teaching Christianity. Now, <clears throat> I want you to understand this. The Methodist Church preaches how to have a good marriage. They preach how to raise your children. They preach how to be. Like, this church was preaching the Word of God from first, from the first chapter, first verse through the end of the book. And then they went to another one. And I'm telling you, there is something going on when you are being taught systematically the Word of God, like Troy does. You're understanding more and more of it, and I was excited so excited we all took notes but nobody took any more notes than i did in fact i got i still have them notes from the word of god about that and it didn't make any difference to me how long he preached it i asked him how long he prepared how long he spent to prepare the sermon in the sunday morning he said 44 hours <laughs> And uh, so he said, my word, my, my life ambition is to teach the word of God. And y'all are paying me to do that. He says, uh, I can't have a better life than what I've got now. So I was involved with that. I was, became an elder in that church. I uh, became a Sunday school teacher in that church. It went very well. And uh, my wife still went to her church, but she developed Alzheimer's. And then she got to the point where I could not trust her driving anymore. So I quit my church and tempted her to her church. And it, <clears throat> they failed to convert me to the Church of Christ. But nevertheless, I had a good time with them. They appreciated whatever I might utter to them. But it became more necessary for me to come down here because my children lived here. And so, regardless of what she wanted, we moved here. And she lasted uh, almost four years here. And she died in 2012. And, and it had been a very hard journey for me. The Bible church here is not teaching the same doctrine that I was accustomed to in the Bible church. So I returned to the Methodist church. There I taught Sunday school. <laughs> Again, that's the thing. Now, of course, we're not, I'm, the church is, has not met for a long time, but now they're meeting again. But I'm coming here instead. And I, I wanted you to know that my life has been one in which since the age of 13, 
I have felt that the Lord's hand was on me. How many times I've seen He saved my life, I, I can't, you know, even tell you how many times. But He did save my life. And I'm now 90 years old. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. And thank you for listening to that. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. You know, Mr. Bailey's dad delivered mail on a horse. Right? Okay, we're going to uh, pick up today. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. We're just going to point out a few more things. Like I said, I'm, this is not verse-by-verse verse exposition of Romans 13. We'll get to that. At the rate we're going through the book of Romans on Wednesday night, we should be there in about 35 years, I guess. <laughs> we will get there. As a matter of fact, Tim told me recently, he said, well, don't worry about it. We'll cover it in about 30 years. <laughs> Exodus 1. Exodus 1. Okay? And what I just want to show you all is, look, we, this is what we've got to hang our hat on. God ordains the powers that be. Which powers? Oh, All the powers. Oh. Folks, God is sovereign. One of the reasons why, in my opinion, the attack on the doctrine of election is always so strong by the devil because when you lose the idea that God is sovereign in all things, He begins to become less than God. And what I mean by that is, um, dispensational theology will tell you, no, God was involved in the affairs of man in the Old Testament. But since the cross, He's hands off and everything's done. Folks, that is absolutely a lie. He's the same God. He never changes. And if you don't think He's as involved today, you just heard Mr. Bailey said He feels His hand on Him. We know that, don't we? Um, he, uh, and talking with a loved one, uh, uh, she told me, she said, you know, I can remember even being little, praying in the closet, knowing God heard me. Don't we? I can remember laying under my bed, terrified, praying, knowing that if something happens, God's here. You say, were you saved? No, I wasn't saved. But, did God know me before the foundation yeah. of the world? And He has led me down a path, just as He did this person and every other person, and that path is designed for each individual, and guess what? Everything on that path is for our eternal good. Now, can't we see that as we get older? Now, watch this example. In Exodus chapter 1, it tells us all about Joseph's uh, uh, relatives. Remember, Joseph got to Egypt, and God made him the second most powerful man in the world, didn't he? Yeah. And he brought his dad down there and his brothers, and they prospered, and they had the best of the land, and things were great for a long time, weren't they? But, it says in verse 7, The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. There they are, blessed of God, right? Now, there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. What's about to happen? A change of administration, right? Now stop right there. How bad is it going to get for Israel? Bad. bad. Real bad. We've all watched Ten Commandments with Moses. Or uh, Moses Charlton Heston. Yeah. Hey, look, everything in there is not biblically accurate, but it's a good movie. Yeah. And folks, they, they became slaves. And I'm talking about the worst kind of slaves. In fact, it got so bad, he would take away the products they needed to do their job and still demand they do their job. They were beaten. I mean, things were horrible. How did they feel? God le God's left us. God has turned from us. But you know if you check it out, they turned from God. They did. How do you know that? They're not, sacri or they're not circumcising their children anymore, are they? Even Moses didn't circumcise his child. In other words, slowly they had turned to the idols of, of Egypt, hadn't they? You can rest assured that's what they've done because just as soon as Moses went up Mount Sinai, what did they do? They made a golden calf. See, in, in, in between the lines you read, they followed God and they were blessed of God. But when they turned and became going along with the world's policies, well, God withdrew His hand from them. Now, was it for their good? But did it seem like their good when they were in the middle of it? They couldn't see that, could they? So here we read it. It says, There rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. He said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any of war, they join up under our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. In other words, he said, look, we're going to have to do something about these people if we want to stay in power, right? Mm -hmm. So the persecution gets horrible. They start murdering their kids, don't they? 
And yet the whole time behind the scenes, what's really going on? God is setting them up for redemption. He says it's like bringing forth His firstborn. As a matter of fact, he, he uses an analogy later that says that Israel was in the womb of Egypt. A nation growing inside a nation, right? It, it's an amazing picture, and I, won't, I don't want to get vulgar about it, but Joseph went down one man, didn't he? Like one seed going down into the egg, and what began to happen in Egypt? A nation started to grow. And to multiply, just like we see in a woman. And now when a woman starts uh, uh, getting close, what begins to happen? Labor pains. That I, I can't speak yeah, from experience. Huh? The man catches eggs. Yeah, the man catches eggs. Pain twice. Got that right. <laughs> But what God was doing was, what you see in this story is you see the time had come for God to redeem His people, hadn't it? And so what did He begin to do? He began to position them for redemption. And you know one of the first things that's going to mean? Turn them back to Him. What did it take to turn them? It took a hard rod, folks. Now look, this is what we're dealing with. Now I know there's hard times on the horizon and people say, why do you keep talking about this? Because we need to be prepared. Don't let it shake your faith. Let's look beyond the, the, the current situation and let's look at the big picture. Right? If I'm suffering chastisement, what does that tell me? I'm a child of God. Right? Now, I don't mean the chastisement of the world. I mean that chastisement God ordains. Okay? So God is positioning these people to redeem them, isn't He? You remember what Jesus told them in 70 AD? He said, when you see these things come to pass, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Folks, we see the whole world right now is heading in this direction, don't we? Now look, this has happened to every country along the way for 2,000 years. I don't mean communism, but I mean persecution, okay? So then, now, today, it's lining up in a way like it's never lined up, isn't it? I mean, look, they've got us right now where they literally they control our lives. If you don't think you're at the mercy of the government's life, where do you get your water and your power from? Look, my granny could smoke meat. She could make it. I, probably my grandpa knew how to dig a well, I, I would assume. I don't know, but he sure raised hog. Remember the hogs when we were little? But the point being is they knew how to make it. But what have we become over the last 80 years? Dependent. We're dependent. And folks, when they get you totally dependent, my granny used to say this. She said, no offense to anybody that works at Walmart, she said, watch out for Walmart. Remember that, Gina? She said, yeah, them prices are good, but, and this was 25 years ago, she said, yeah, them prices are good, but watch, they'll own everybody else, they'll shut down all the little businesses, and then the prices will go up. That's common sense, isn't it? Okay. So do you and I fret about how are we going to make it? No. We say God redeemed them. Did Israel get out of here? So the persecution they suffered was for what purpose? They're good. Okay. Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to All. them who love God, to them who are the, uh, called according to His purpose. Our problem is we want it according to our purpose. Right. It's we're, we're all just like little kids. I have learned uh, a whole lot about God in the last two and a half years. And I've learned that through that, that thing back there. Because, I mean, seriously, you it's something, isn't it? Y'all you, 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 that raised children know what I mean. It really is something. I'll tell you what I heard. Mr. Bailey said over there that his parents learned a whole lot from his freshman to senior year. Think on that for a minute. <laughs> you know what he means, don't you? Yeah. Well, we, we also need to learn a whole lot about what God's doing. He is behind the scenes and He's in control. Now take that information and go back to 2 Samuel 7. About, you know, about nine books from the front, I think. It's a uh, find. Yeah, find. Well, Ruth's little bitty. Find the. Uh, Kings. 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 Yeah. Kings. Yeah. It's right for four seconds. He said second thing. No. After first thing. <laughs> hey, y'all know too. Uh, let me say this real quick because this really helped me when somebody told me this. But um, he. Sometimes I can remember sitting in front of a Bible teacher and they'd say what book and I was embarrassed that I couldn't find it. I want to tell y'all from the perspective of the Bible teacher, Mr. Bailey's going to tell you, 
That's a wonderful thing. Isn't it, Mr. Bell? You know what you find out? You ain't got a bunch of people that have been indoctrinated, generally speaking. Now, there are times when you run to somebody that just knows their Bible. But usually what you've got is you've got people that haven't been indoctrinated. And you know who's the easiest people to teach? Those that you don't have to unteach. Okay? I have a friend that's an engineer in Florida, and he said the worst employees in the world are those engineers straight out of college. Yeah. He said they come through the door and think they know everything. He said the first thing you got to do is teach them, forget all of that. You can remember the, the math and whatnot, but forget it. You're in the real world now. Hey, Courtney could probably tell us school was a lot of help, but when did you really start to learn, Courtney? When I did it. When you start doing it, okay? So it's the same with Christianity. So look, if you can't find it, don't be embarrassed. Be glad that nobody has brainwashed you, okay? There was a time when I could find every book in here and I couldn't tell you nothing about what it meant. Okay? Now, in 2 Samuel 7, the Lord says in promising to David, He said, I will be his father. Now he's talking about David and Solomon, but ultimately he's talking about Christ. He said he shall be... Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 7. Yep, 14. 14. 14. 14. 2 Samuel 7, 14, he says, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now, you could say, how could that possibly, I can see how that could refer to Solomon, but how could that refer to Christ? Was Christ chastened with a rod? Yeah. Or whose iniquity? Ours. Did he commit that iniquity? But was it put to his account? So he was treated as though he committed it. But let's go back to the historical reference to Solomon himself. Folks, y'all look at Solomon's life. This is a wonderful example for us, all right? Here's Solomon. What was Solomon... God said, ask for whatever you want. And what did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Now, folks, that's good. He didn't ask for riches, and yet God gave them to him. He didn't ask for women, and yet he wound up with a thousand women, didn't he? But the whole point is, was there something better he could have asked for? Not their wisdom. Huh? Salvation. But salvation, yeah. How about just plain old righteousness? Yeah. I want to be right with God. I mean, God, I want to serve you and be right with you. Isn't that the thing we ought to hunger and thirst over? But Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him and blessed him. What did the wisest man in the world become? An idolater. I'm serious. The smartest man that has ever lived. And don't let somebody tell you Einstein. The Bible says this man. He, uh, Sienna's favorite story is when they had the two women that one's baby died. Remember that? She loves that story. She'll, every few mornings she comes in and tells it to him. Here's Solomon sitting there and they didn't know what to do and he had so much horror sense. He said, well, just bring me a sword. I'll cut it in half. And before he could get the words out of his mouth, the real mom jumped up and said, no, huh? He said, okay, here's your mom. That's just common sense, isn't it? But the wisest man in the world fell into idolatry. Could God have stopped him from falling? Did he? No. No. How did he get into the idolatry? His wives. His wives. He wanted to keep peace at home and, and keep not so much peace at home. He wanted to make all the women happy. And it goes beyond just having liking women. I know he liked women, but uh, he was making, it says many of them were princesses. That means he was making treaties. And you remember back then how they would do? They would make married her. So he did. He had this huge empire. But his wives led him astray, didn't it? But thank God, he, he, over here we got Proverbs, okay? But what do we have over here? Ecclesiastes. And what did that man say in Ecclesiastes? <coughs> vanity, vanity, vanity. All is vanity. What did he find out about his entire life? He said, I've wasted my life in the service of God. Don't mean I wasted it serving Him. I wasted all that time. I suspect, many times I say, look, when I stand before the Lord, the very first thing I'm probably going to think is, all oh, that wasted time. It breaks my heart, but you know what? All we do is move forward, isn't it? So when did he say he had learned over the 40 years? Look out for this world. There ain't but one thing that matters, and that is to serve the true King, isn't it? Then was his life a waste? What's he doing in eternity? He, he's serving God with that lesson learned, isn't he? You know, I, I suspect, I joke with my sisters, I used to tell them we would get around my granny, y'all hear me talk about her all the time, we'd get around my granny and we would say, you love us more than all our other cousins and whatnot. Remember Gina? 
And she would she would say no, and then she finally would say, well, y'all needed me more. <laughs> well, then I would say, hey, Granny, you love me more than uh, these sisters, don't you? And she said, no, that ain't true, but y'all know what? She beat me constantly. <laughs> I mean, constantly, but you know what? I needed it, okay? I know I needed it. But you know what it made me do? Love her more. I love her. You know why? Oh, I learned some you. valuable lessons from her. Valuable lessons. I don't shoplift today. I don't. She taught me a lesson. You don't shoplift. So I don't shoplift. You say, well, would you shoplift? I don't know what I would do. But I know one thing. The lessons that you learn under a loving parent are never wasted, are they? What are we doing in this life? Boy, God is training us for eternity. And can y'all not see way back here, He was setting His people up to be delivered, right? What did they have to do? What had to happen to them to, to deliver them first? He had to turn them to Him. What did it take? It took hard times. But then what did they finally do when it got so bad? They cried out to God. Folks, He was teaching them, you call to Me, you look to Me. When you get in a place where there's nothing, no hope but God, then you're in the right place, aren't you? And when they called out, what happened? God delivered them. You read the book of Judges, it's the same thing over and over and over. And folks, our life is the same thing. We do this same thing over and over, don't we? And yet we've got a wonderful promise from Solomon. He said, the righteous fall seven times. That means as many as you want to count. The number seven is, is for perfect. The righteous fall seven times, but what happens? God gets them up. He said the wicked fall and are no more. Isn't that a wonderful comfort to you? I know even no matter what I ever did, my granny loved me and she was not going to get rid of me. I told you all before about that time that I avoided her for about three weeks. You know, for that three weeks, I would sneak in and out and come around and I just avoided her because I knew and I was terrified she was going to find out. And when it got so bad, I could not stand not seeing my granny. Uh, we would watch Perry Mason after school, and we'd eat cream of mushroom soup with crackers, and it was just, it, I looked forward to it in school. And so it got so bad for me avoiding her that finally I turned to her and I confessed what I had done. Right? And you know what she told me? She said, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Folks, that's the Lord. Okay? That's, that's a small little sample of the Lord. The Lord did this to Israel so that they would turn to Him. Now, in hard times, don't people turn to the Lord? Yes. Then why would me and you pray that there were no hard times? You see, it's our own flesh and desire to be comfortable in it. I hate the thought of not having my air conditioner, not having this or that. But folks, y'all know what? Whatever it is, God will comfort us. Amen. I, I'm going to give you an example. Out there in the worst place on the face of the earth, the, the, out there in the Sinai Peninsula and, and beyond it, nothing out there. And what did God give them? A cloud by day and fire by night. Folks, He kept them cool during the day and warm at night, and He fed them the whole way, didn't He? You think He would do less for the church? No, we can, we can rest assured that the Lord will redeem us. Now, if y'all would, go over uh, again. Let's turn to uh, Revelation 12. And just look at a, a picture here real quick because it, it ought to give us some comfort. Do y'all remember we went through the book of Revelation um, part by part here, maybe oh, yeah. last year, maybe I guess? But... Um, one of the things we found out right off the bat is the book of Revelation is not a book that's just written about some future time. Folks, if it was, what good has it done Christians for 2,000 years? John said it was the things that were shortly to come to pass, and they started to come to pass, didn't they? We're seeing how the devil works, and what Revelation really is, is it's a picture of the spiritual warfare going on between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. We see what's happening on the earth, and we see the powers behind the scenes, don't we? Well, here in chapter 12, we've got uh, uh, an example. This is the beginning of a new vision, and he's going to show us why things are as they are. He said, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. This is the church, the people of God. Remember, J uh, Joseph had the dream, and his mother and father <laughs> were the sun and the moon and the twelve brother stars. It's God's elect people, okay? And it says, she being with child cry, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now this is going to be the, the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come forth out of this woman, literally from Mary's womb, isn't he? But it's going to come from God's people. Verse 3. 
there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his seven heads. And you all know that all represents uh, certain things and forms. It's, got, it's not physical. Don't be looking for those dragons people draw. and that. It's not that. He says, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Did Satan, when he fall, take a third of angels with him? Yeah. These are the demons and spirits that we fight against now. He said, The dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. What form did the dragon take to do that? Herod. 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 Good job, Tony. Herod. Folks, Herod was there. What did Herod say? Kill all the babies. Again, it's the killing of those babies. You keep seeing it, don't we? Folks, the shedding of innocent blood is one of the worst offenses to God. It, it really is as a people. Individually, it's a sin. But as a people, it's an earmark of a corrupt society. Now he says, he's there to devour. It says, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. All nations? Who is this? Christ. So if he's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron, is he ruling over all governments? Yeah. Because there ain't a government in this world that can do anything that God doesn't allow. You say, well, God wouldn't ordain all these ungodly governments. Folks, God ordained Nebuchadnezzar. He does these things. He doesn't say the governments are going to be good and they're going to be holy. Matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he saw the history in the future, didn't he? And to him, it was a wonderful, idolatrous statue, a great statue, right? But a man of God, Daniel, saw the same history, and what did he call those things? Wild beasts, ripping and tearing. Now that's the government, wild beasts. He said, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. There's the resurrection and the ascension. And the woman, the people of God, fled into the wilderness, the world, where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And that's not literal. That's an example of a period of time, incomplete period. In other words, it's going to have an end to it. Okay? It's, not, it's not indefinite. Now, what's the wilderness represent? The world. Just after Jesus Christ ascends up, they preach the gospel there in Jerusalem, and shortly after that, what happened to them? They stoned Stephen. Matter of fact, Saul is leading the charge. They stoned Stephen, and what happened to the church? They're scattered. And you say, oh, that's so sad, is it? No. What was God doing? He took that seat and threw it out there. The folks, they'd have stayed right there if God wouldn't have made them go. Out they went, and what happened? We 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about Jesus Christ, aren't we? That ain't normal. That's not, nothing normal about that. So he says, there was war in heaven. See, this is a spiritual battle. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. You know, behind everything, there's these spiritual powers going on, isn't there? Folks, if me and you could see the spiritual realm, it would probably terrify us. Thank God there's a veil there. Our flesh prevents us from seeing spiritual things, doesn't it? It's all behind the veil today. And yet in the Old Testament, even sometimes in the New, were there times when God peeled the veil back? One of my favorite stories is with uh, Elisha. Yeah. Elisha's about to go down amongst 100,000 enemies, and there's him and his helper. And his helper said, we ain't going down there. And Elisha said, well, there's more with us than they got. And the guy said, what? It's me and you. And he prayed. He said, Lord, open his eyes. And all of a sudden, the Lord peered back where he could see the spiritual realm. And what did he see all in the treetops? The angels of God. And the army of God up there. Doesn't that give you comfort? Yeah. You know, Job and the horrible things Job went through, could Satan do anything God didn't allow? Mm -hmm. Do you think Job is mad today over those boils? Mm -hmm. You think he's mad over the loss of his children? No. Mm -hmm. He's not fretting over any of that. Why? Because in the end, what did he say? He'll see him again. He, not only would he see him again, he said, look, I have come to know God in a better way and I've seen something. He was a godly man and he was righteous and he was already saved, but for his own edification, what did God do? He put him under the fire or something. He let Satan get at him. And in the end, he said, essentially, he said, I thought I knew God. He said, I talked like I knew some things about God. What a fool was I. I had no idea about the glory of God. What did the persecution do to him? God grew in his estimation. He went down in his estimation. Ain't that what we're doing? Okay, now it says... Um, verse 8 and uh, Satan prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven 
The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now being cast out of heaven, don't take these things literally. This is a book of symbolism. You remember Jesus said at the cross, now is the God of this world cast out. Jesus bound Satan at the cross by a certain ability, didn't he? What could Satan do before the cross? He could accuse anybody and everybody of breaking God's law, couldn't he? Was he right to say, sinner? And yet God let some in, didn't he? And what did the angels say about that? How's he doing this? This don't seem righteous. Well, what do we find out on this side of the cross? Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Can Satan accuse you of breaking Moses' law? Can he accuse you of being guilty of God's law? Why not? Christ did it for us. So Jesus bound him. And folks, the proof that Jesus bound him is these men started going into the most pagan lands on earth and what started happening? Thousands of people started getting saved. I mean, y'all think how un un uh, unlikely it is that a little short fellow like Paul that was grotesque to look at and, and had probably the marks of his stoning comes into town and speaks words and a bunch of people that have never heard of Moses, Jesus Christ, leave their temple they've been going to all their life and, and follow Paul. Is that normal? It's the, it's the Spirit of God. He did bound Satan. But it says, verse 9, And that uh, great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. You see how he fights? He deceives. He deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In other words, he lost certain power. Okay? It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Notice the voices in heaven. When did the kingdom of God come in this form? When Christ came. Okay? He says, and the power of His Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Folks, many of them died, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I implore y'all, if you've never watched it, please watch uh, Tortured for Christ. Yeah, was... oh, yeah. Please watch it. It's a great documentary about Richard Wormbrand. These aren't things that happened in the first century. This happened in the 1960s. And it's just what happened when the communists came into Romania, I believe it is. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. And all it is, they came in. And what happened for the one man that stood up for for the truth? They, they persecuted him horribly. You all know what his organization is doing today? People ask me all the time about... Uh, you know, ways that uh, we've got a brother in Michigan that told me today, he said, you know, I really feel like uh, God's given me a great job. And he said, I need to, I don't know what to do. I understand that. So many of these, uh, y'all know these charities, so many of them are just a scam. And, it's, you know, we don't, you don't even know many times. Folks, I can tell y'all with a pretty good certain reason you can go voice of martyrs. Yeah. You want, you want to help somebody? Give you money to voice of martyrs. They take care of preachers' wives that are locked up all over the world. I mean, it's a good organization. It's not a, it's, and they're preaching the gospel. But anyway, that man started that. How many people have been helped through that? Thousands, hundreds of thousands. And where's Richard Wormbrand? Sitting in heaven, still earning rewards while he, after he's dead. You think he's upset he suffered for a few years? No. So here he says. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. How do you overcome the devil? By the blood of the Lamb and the Word of God. Folks, y'all know when turmoil comes, stop and go to the Word. I, I tell y'all, every morning the best way to start your day is start out with the Word of God. Give Him the first fruits of your day and watch the rest of your day. He'll take care of you. So He says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, the lost people, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Remember we, we talked when we went through Revelation. He's bound back here and for a long season God keeps him bound, doesn't he? But then what does he do right at the end? He takes the binders off and he looses him for that little season. And in that little season, what does he do? He, 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 he deceives in a way he's never done before. There's rebellion. There's the worst form of government that's ever going to exist. And I'm sorry to tell you all, guess where we live? We live in a little season. Watch what he does. It says, 
When the dragon saw he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman, the church, which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. That's the exact way he said he delivered Israel out of Egypt, on the wings of an eagle. To the church were given two wings of a great eagle. Hey, can y'all see the church down through history flying through the world? He, I, I, if I could get y'all to do anything with reading, I'd get you to read church history. It, it's a wonderful lesson. I mean, it's really, isn't it, Mr. Bailey? Mr. Bailey's a big reader, and I, I'm always able to lean on him. You know what you find out the church did down through history? Ran for her life. And everywhere she ran, what did she do? Preach the gospel. Can y'all see how God pushed them where He wanted them? You know, it got so bad at one point, the, the preachers of the gospel in England, it got so bad, they, they you remember they kicked a bunch of the Puritans out of the church, and I mean, trying to starve them to death, and what did they do? They got on a boat. Where'd they go? They come over here. Folks, the people that started our country were absolutely Christians. The men that founded our government, not so. And don't get mad at me for what I'm about to say. Read your history. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson were not Christians. They were deists. Okay? Absolute deists. Benjamin Franklin was a great friend of George Whitfield. You know what George Whitfield wrote? Someone sent me an email, and I'm not picking on you if you watch it, but check it out. George Whitfield preached the gospel to Benjamin Franklin over and over and over. You know all Benjamin Franklin was interested in? The scientific experiment of how far his voice would travel. Now, I've told y'all God would carry his voice three quarters of a mile. There were so many people to hear. You know what he wrote in his, Whitfield wrote in his diary just as he, towards the end? He said it was a great regret, or regret, of, <coughs> regret of his to know that his good friend Benjamin Franklin had never and probably would never call on the Lord. So don't tell me that our country was a country established by God. Folks, God established his government. Our people rebelled. But what about the common man? People say this was a Christian nation. Yes, those people were Christians. But what happened? Unchristian men got above them and slowly began to take power. We look down through history. And it, 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 throughout the history of our country, we have had a lot of Christian people that live here. And God has blessed us, hasn't He? But is that changing fast? Yeah. It's really changing fast, folks. You know, the communists said, give me one generation to, to educate. And he said, we, we can change. It is. I mean, they've, they've legislated God out of things and also basically we're being brought to a point right now where we're probably looking at some of these things. Maybe not. Maybe the Lord will come back. But either way, can we trust the Lord? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So watch what he says happens next. To the woman were given two great wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. The exact amount of time he persecutes did God promise to nourish us? Yeah. Well, if God doesn't nourish us, what is He doing? He's lying. Is God going to break His Word to us? No. It says the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. Y'all remember how he works. He deceives. When did all these cults start? Right here, 1800s. When did all this technological boom start? Electricity and all. Right here. When did the world start to change? Right here, folks. Look, right here, what were they riding? Horses, what they do for a living? They farmed and, and, you know, I mean, they lived that way for all this time, didn't they? We get down here, though, and things start to change rapidly, okay? So, as these things begin to change, we read this. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Look at all the Bible versions today, right? I mean, seriously, look at them. Look, we use the King James Bible. I prefer it. I like it. I don't get in arguments about it, and I'm not going to fight with anybody over other versions. I will say this. It's not so much the words that are used in those versions that's the problem. That was not the idea. The Jesuits started this, and again, I'm, you, there's lots of, about this, but basically they said, look, we have got to break people's dependence on the Word of God. Well, how do you do that? You, you basically take and you take and you uh, you have to break people's confidence in it. You know what I get told probably once a month? Okay, which Bible? Which Bible? You know what that means? Mm -hmm. I go to the bookstore and there's 30 of them. Which one's right? A Muslim fella told me one time, y'all don't even know what book to use. At least we've got one book. 
You see, it was all that higher criticism. It wasn't so much to change the Word of God as it was to cast doubt on whether or not we have the Word of God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If a man's on a desert island and you give him an NIV, is he going to come up with the conclusion that Jesus Christ died for his sins? You better believe he is. Read it. He's going to come up with the same conclusion. It's not the words that the, the changing of the words so much that matter. They have to change words to get new copyrights. It's the fact that there's now confusion, isn't there? People say, well, I know, I mean, that's, that's, you know, my grandpa believed that, but come on, we're educated, we're smarter now. Well, this is all the deception of Satan. So-called uh, new doctrines, dispensationalism, 1820s, it all starts about the same time. Charles Taze Russell and Jehovah's Witnesses, same time. Mary Baker, Edgar, all these things started sprouting up. Now he says, verse 16, The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Who swallows up all that false baloney? The lost folks, the professors of religion. But what did God promise? He said He'll keep us from it. Now do you and I ever go down a dog trail? Yeah. And God will let us, won't He? And you get down that dog trail and you finally have to cry out and say, Lord, I have fouled up. I, I'm wrong here. I have just absolutely depended on my own intelligence and I've made a fool of myself again. If you don't show me, I'll be lost. And what happens? It brings you right back to the course. So the last verse says, The dragon was wroth with the woman. He could not destroy the church. Has Satan been able to snuff out the church? No. She's still in the world. So here's his last resort. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the individual believers, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we're out of time, but what happens finally in the end? What is God really doing over here in this little season? He's gathering all this army together in one big battle against who? Against His church. And before she overcomes the church, what happens? Fire comes down from God out of heaven. Now what is that? It's the second coming of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Folks, all that's happening is the camp of the saints all around the world is being surrounded and they're not going to win. If you trust Jesus Christ, you're already on the winning team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for the last 20 years, anybody that got drafted in the NFL, where'd they want to go? Patriots. <laughs> I'm not a Patriots fan, but if you said, where do you want to play in New England? <laughs> Why? I'm going to win a Super Bowl, right? Every free agent in New England. You see, the whole point then is if you're on the winning team, what do you have to worry about? Okay. Nothing. Don't fret. Don't worry, folks. Jesus Christ is in charge. And if we can't trust what He said in this book, we're just wasting our time anyway, aren't we? Mm -hmm. He is reliable. He said, heaven and earth shall pass. His words will never pass. Okay. Any questions about that? We're going to be done with that because we need to get back to the Gospel and more important things. But Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word and for the incredible comfort that we get from it. Lord, we thank You for Your faithfulness, for the surety of Your Word. We thank You for Your Son and His steadfastness. We thank You for the Spirit, our comforter, and the strength that He brings us. Lord, we pray that You guide us and direct us in our daily lives, that we might be faithful witnesses and faithful ambassadors unto You. Let us not fret and worry and get nervous over this world. Lord, as a matter of fact, let us just divert our attention from it as much as we can. Not, not living like fools, Lord, but living knowing that there's a better day coming and that we set our affection on things above and not on things on this earth. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.